Welcome back to Face the Nation. We continue our conversation with the Vietnam War filmmakers, Ken Burns and Lynn Novick. Ken, I want to go pick up on what Lynn was saying about the two sides in this. No, I think the reconciliation is possible within our two countries, where we're both divided, as well as between the two countries, where we seem to have at least superficially solved the distance between us. And we had a North Vietnamese soldier that we interviewed who had come actually to New Hampshire, where we were editing and made some comments. We put him into the film, and he had a chance recently when Lynn took the film back to Vietnam to look at it. And he said, you know, when I was in the Army through the propaganda, I saw the demonstrations that were taking taking place against the war in the United States as a sign of our weakness as a country and their superiority because they had a kind of monolithic sense of morale and purpose. Um, but he said, I realize now that that was a sign of your strength, that he didn't have that luxury of being able to say, you know what, I disagree without ending up in a re-education camp or worse. And I think for us Americans who are still torn on the bias about Vietnam to realize that from the distance of our enemy, they can actually now appreciate uh, all of the things that were going on with us might help us all heal. Right. Lynn, let me ask you about the American presidency and this war. You so beautifully chart the many presidents of both parties yeah. who were a part of this. What, where, what was the state of the American presidency through the Vietnam War? Uh, we think that you can really see a sea change between when the war began or when the, our American got involved in Vietnam, which is right after World War II, and that was the Truman administration, the United Eisenhower administration, then Richard Johnson. Um, Kennedy, Johnson, and Nixon, that, you know, there was a sense that we believed in our leaders, that they were uh, good people, that they knew what they were doing, that they were competent, that they would do what was in the best interest of the nation, that they would not lie to the people, they would tell the truth, you know, and that they would sort of carry on the nation's business in the best possible way. And that just eroded and eroded and eroded. You had sort of a credibility gap where the public began to doubt that they were getting the true story under Johnson. And it, it sort of metastasized into terrible cynicism under Nixon that we cannot trust our presidents, that they don't tell us the truth, that they are not doing the right thing, and that, you know, just sort of a pox on both their houses. Right. And that's sort of where we are now. It's become sort of from naive idealist sort of faith to skepticism to cynicism. And that's a disturbing thing. And you hear this in the audio tapes that we were able to include in the film, where you hear our president speaking privately, especially Johnson and Nixon, about what they really think about the war, which is they have terrible doubts. They have no confidence. They want to get out. They don't see the point. And they go out on television the next day and say everything's going great. Ken, this is, a, it's about a, a decision that becomes, in a sense, irrevocable right. and has its own momentum. It does. Give me your sense of that. And also, as a filmmaker, how do you take those of us who weren't living in that moment Back to it, because now Vietnam, it just it, it connotes failure right. for people. Like, exactly. how did they not know this was going to be a disaster? How do you convey that to well, people? Well, you know what? It, good storytelling, someone once told me, is and then, and then, and then. <laughs> and so you just start at the beginning, and you ask certain questions of the Truman administration, and they're making decisions based on domestic political considerations, which is a polite way, you know, <laughs> of saying, will I get reelected? And Eisenhower, and Kennedy, and Johnson, and Nixon. What's interesting for, for us filmmakers, and maybe it's too much inside baseball, is that we're trying to sort of manage a combination of a bottom-up and a top-down way of communicating history. Or so-called ordinary folks at the granular level of combat, as you saw in that first clip. But then also we've got the president sort of supposedly top down 30,000 feet right. with our best interests. And here you're hearing in the intimacy of the tapes, particularly the Johnson and Nixon tapes, the exact opposite, not only of what they're saying, but it explodes this notion of the great men and returns them to the same very human level as everyone else we're dealing with. So you're perceiving this momentum that all of them know exactly that this is not going to work out, that, that as, you know, we have a strategy of not losing rather than winning or any articulation of particular goals that would represent winning. And then they're also saying one thing in public and another in private, but you can get at their, their, their humanity and their failures at the same time, our ordinary witnesses are betraying the same sorts of complications. John Musgrave, you know, I hated them and I feared them at the same time. Right. Lynn, what was it like to have the Vietnam in your war in your head for this <laughs> length of time? <laughs> well, I think it's true for Ken and me and our writer Jeff Ford, our producer Sarah Botstein. We, none of us got a whole lot of sleep over the course of this. We sort of, it was a 24-7 um, obsession. And it was devastating. I mean, it was devastating and it was deeply inspiring. It was devastating to think of the lives lost, American 58,000 lives, Vietnamese 3 million lives, 300,000 are still missing in Vietnam. So to try to absorb the, the meaning of that was totally devastating. Every time we go to the wall, 
we cry. Every time we think about what happened in Vietnam, we cry. And yet we were also just deeply moved and sort of inspired by the courage of the people who shared their stories with us. You know, that they sort of summoned the um, inner resources to speak about things that were deeply troubling and to see them living and breathing and, you know, able to function and tell us what happened to them. People who lost a son, people who lost a friend, people who were wounded horribly. Um, just they survived and here they are and how, that's incredible. How did they do that? I mean, were you, they're so calm in these descriptions. What, what you want to do is try to go in and listen. I mean, too often now in a kind of journalistic dynamic, you've got a set of questions. You're, you're, you're not, it isn't really listening because what we want to do is hear something in a tick of the voice or a twitch of a cheek mm -hmm. and don't have a, just a couple of minutes. We have you know, an hour or two hours right. to sit with them and to hear that that question number seven may in fact have a B, C, D, E, F, G thing and suddenly you're down a wormhole that we, and more importantly they, weren't completely sure they were going to go to and so there is nothing more satisfying professionally than to be witness to sort of express memory for the first time. And some of these people had stories, I won't say practiced ever, it's impossible in the Vietnam War to have this practiced, but some of them, I think, surprised themselves by the way the moment the memory overtook them. And it's said that, you know, you fight wars twice, yeah. once on the battlefield and once in memory. And if you've got your camera there and you're sensitive to it, you can sometimes see the, the, the conflict, and it's not always between armies, it's within a particular person. And that's that kind of growth and that kind of development is something you want to capture too and so many of the 79 people you meet on camera in the film undergo profound psychological and emotional changes as a result of this war and thankfully gratefully they were willing to share that transformation with us. Lynn what surprised you the most in the process? Well I, I was devastated to find the sense that our leadership never really had confidence that the war could be won from the very beginning and to think about all the lives lost and all the uh, terrible suffering that people went through both here and in Vietnam and and I, I think I didn't expect that I thought there would have been some moments along the way and I think understanding how deeply complicated the war still is in Vietnam you know they won the the, the, the Vietnamese government and the Vietnamese people that are, are on the winning side are now to this day reckoning with the losses they suffered and asking questions about what it means some of the same questions we asked and that surprised us we really didn't know that there would be this sense of was it worth it what price did we pay? Were our leaders doing the right thing? The same questions we ask, they're asking in Vietnam, and that, that was revelatory for sure. All right, we're going to have to leave it there. Thank you both so very much. Mm -hmm. It's an amazing piece of work. And tonight, it will air on PBS at 8 p.m. Eastern, The Vietnam War, and we'll be right back. Time now for our political panel. Susan Page is the Washington Bureau Chief for USA Today. Jeffrey Goldberg is the Editor-in-Chief at The Atlantic. We're also joined by Slate Magazine's Chief Political Correspondent and CBS News Political Analyst Jamel Bowie and Ramesh Panuru, who is a Senior Editor at the National Review. Jeffrey, I want to start with you with the Secretary of State's comments on North Korea. What did you make of this? Uh, he's walking a line, obviously. He, uh, the, the thing that's interesting about his position is that uh, you, you, you see that th this administration still believes that the leader of North Korea is someone who could possibly be negotiated with. They, they still believe that China has some capability of pressuring the North Koreans. These are, these are huge questions, and people like me who've watched this for 20 years uh, see new administrations come in and believe that they can move this issue, and I'm, I'm a little bit surprised that, that they believe they can move the issue to the degree that they, they think. But uh, on the other hand, they are talking in a rational, reasonable way, understanding that the military option is really not much of an option if you're in South Korea, if you're in Japan, obviously. And so he's, he's walking a line, but I don't predict great success out of this, this, this plan. Ramesh, it, it, it does seem difficult to kind of try and figure out. We're a few weeks away from fire and fury, which was President Trump's uh, said that if North Korea threatened again, it would see fire and fury. But the Secretary of State, while saying there's a military option, is clearly still working the diplomatic, very clear at the first to say, we don't want a regime change in North Korea, which is a clear signal to them. What do you make of where things are now? Uh, this is the latest iteration of a, of a pattern, really. 
right? And I think that the Secretary of State's call for a de-escalation of rhetoric is particularly interesting in light of the president's earlier comments about fire and fury. Look, I, I think he's, he's conceding that the attempts we have made to send a message that they need to calm down and stop saber rattling have not gotten through. Uh, and so I, it, does, it does have a little bit of a disconcerting sense of spinning of the wheels. Just a quick point on that. You know, he talks about the four no's, but the South Koreans, our allies, just this week, let it be known that they have a decapitation plan uh, at the ready. In other words, a, a violent removal of North Korea's leadership. So the North Koreans, I'm sure, are not hearing Rex Tillerson. They're hearing about the decapitation plan. Well, and, and Susan, they're going to hear from the president. They are hearing from the president in tweets and other places. What do you expect? The president goes to the General Assembly next week to speak to the world. What do you, how do you see that in this context? And the number one issue he faces is North Korea. And today he labels the leader of North Korea rocket man in a tweet, which I am sure is not something that Rocket Man finds amusing, right? It's uh, not easily translatable. It's either. not really. Yeah. A, it's not a diplomatic. Although he's a fan of Western music, it's, and so Elton yeah. John could be available for yeah. anyone trying to explain what's going on. You know, the trouble with pursuing uh, endlessly through several administrations trying to deal with the nuclear in North Korea is that they're just closer and closer and closer to being in a really devastating position with their nuclear arsenal. So the the ground the the groundwork on the ground on which this this is being played just gets more and more dangerous uh, with this, just the same options that we've had from the start. Jamel, let me pivot here to the president's uh, negotiating with another group, which is say the Democrats this week. Um, uh, what, where are we at the end of the week in terms of what the president may or may not have agreed to or negotiated with the Democratic leaders and, and then what Republicans are doing with that news? Well, I'm not sure that Democrats are entirely certain of what they've negotiated with the president, but so far what, what, what seems to have happened is that the president has made a commitment to do something on DACA, on Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals, um, the Dreamers. And Democrats believe that uh, they are on the path to some sort of permanent solution for those um, for those immigrants. And the, the trade here is a permanent solution in, in, in for border security for uh, spending on what the president has labeled sort of upgrading the fences and existing walls uh, on the border. That I think is, is may, may happen. Uh, Republicans obviously are not happy about this, although um, Republican lawmakers have said that they're interested in a permanent solution. What I think is interesting about all of this is the activist response to the Democratic negotiations, this worry that uh, to get this deal, Democrats will be set, will be uh, bolstering a hardline immigration status quo on the border. And so there are there are rumblings that some activists don't want this kind of deal if that's what it takes to get a permanent solution for... The Democratic activists. That Democratic yeah. activists. I, yeah. I don't know. You know, this we always knew that when President Trump was elected with this different kind of coalition, that it was possible he could govern as a third-party president. Right. And I think that's what we're, we've been seeing the last few weeks. And this uh, alarms, I think, some activist Democrats, but, boy, it more alarms... I think Republicans who figured we'd accept President Trump and all the uncertainties that created if it meant we could get our priorities signed into law. And that's what it's in question now. I mean, what's but, so, see, I, I actually kind of disagree with that because the border wall that Trump appears to be giving up, he's not asking for that, at least as part of this deal. That's not, it's not as though Mitch McConnell and Paul Ryan are enthusiastic about that. <laughs> that wasn't a priority for the Republican Party establishment. That was a priority for Trump's base right. specifically. And I think a lot of congressional Republicans who are fine with legal status for this group of illegal immigrants who were brought here in most cases as children, uh, that's not a problem for the congressional establishment. That's more of a problem for Trump's very distinctive base. They're the ones that he seems to be selling out. What's so interesting about all of this is that it, it, no, it seems like no one is happy here. On one hand, President Trump has not been able to advance a traditional Republican agenda like I think some Republicans hoped. On the other hand, he is betraying this core base of his that hoped on immigration restrictionism. Well, let me disagree with no. you. You know who's happy here? Americans who look at this and say, you know, for 16 playing years... playing the role been, of optimist today. Yeah. 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 All right. Americans who look at this and say, nothing gets done. 16 years, they debated about dreamers. Now, is it, does it be good? Done. Uh, we got through raising the debt ceiling and funding the government, at least for a couple months, with no big fight. Hurricane relief. I think this is exactly what people have been so frustrated about Washington, that nothing ever seemed to get done because no one was happy with so, making a deal. So, Jeffrey, is this letting Trump be Trump? Uh, letting Trump be Trump allows him to tweet abnormally, let's say, and, and then make 
normal deals with people he actually likes. One of the things that's interesting, I think, I think normal Trump or letting Trump be Trump is is recognizing the fact that he likes Chuck Schumer more than he likes Mitch McConnell. Now, that, that's not a betrayal in his mind because he doesn't care about Mitch McConnell. He doesn't care about Paul Ryan. He does care about the base. And so I think there's always a limit on, on, on how far he'll go as long as the base becomes activated against him on the issue of the wall, which is highly symbolic. You already hear the Trump people, by the way, talking in, going back to this idea of normalcy, they're talking in a more normal way about, well, it's not really a wall, some cuts can be a fence, and some things we already have in place. Um, Trump is being Trump in the sense that we can't predict what tomorrow will bring, and we can't predict what the next tweet will bring. Ramesh, let me st stick to policy a tiny bit here in this context, which is, uh, all right, the president be has the beginnings of a deal here, but Republicans obviously want other things. There are other pieces in play. What are they? What should people pay attention to? But also, does this mean the president now has to be the negotiator through all the complicated pieces as he works with mm -hmm. Democrats, Republicans, with himself, his base? Well, different Republicans want different things. Some would like a policy where it's mandatory for employers to use E-Verify to make sure that their new hires are legally resident in the United States. Uh, if the wall is gone, then there are other things that people want to look at in terms of border security. As for whether Trump is going to negotiate this, what's interesting is we use this language about negotiation and deal, but we're also unused to actual deals being made in Washington, <laughs> D.C., that we haven't noticed that, in fact, the debt ceiling was not a negotiation, was not a deal. That was just Trump saying, I agree with the Democratic position. Yes. And so far, we have a somewhat more specific agreement between Trump and the congressional Democrats on legalizing dreamers that, and everything about the things that Trump might want from the Democrats is vague and up in the air. Susan, how do you see this playing out for Paul Ryan and Mitch McConnell, who have sometimes been on the receiving end of bad news from the president? They would have to manage a bill through here. How does, what's this look like going well, forward? Well, they'd have to agree to bring a bill forward. I mean, uh, that is not, uh, the president may be a little fuzzy on this. It's not always clear, but uh, but Paul Ryan and, and Mitch McConnell will determine what it gets debated on, on the, on the, uh, in Congress. And uh, so he needs them he needs them to at least cooperate, uh, but they're pretty, especially Mitch McConnell, pretty uh, pragmatic, yeah. pretty strategic. Um, you know, I assume I assume it's it's going to be hard for either of them to just just defy the president. One one other thing, it, it's a little bit like triangulation in the Clinton uh, administration, where Clinton worked with the Republicans who were on the rise in Congress, and that worked until Clinton faced impeachment. And he needed to be a Democrat again. And we should never forget that this Russia investigation is proceeding. We don't know where that goes. There may be a time when President Trump really needs to be a Republican again. There's an, one of the many interesting moments, a small point, but one of the most, many interesting moments in the last week is that it seemed as if Trump had forgotten that the Republicans control the House <laughs> and the Senate. Uh, and, 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 and he is postpartisan or nonpartisan or whatever you want to call it, but, but they will remind him right. over time. They will remind him that they're in charge of those bodies. And Jamal, going back to your point about the Democratic base, um, Jerry Connolly, Virginia Democrat, told Politico, there must be both political and moral limitations to how far they're willing to go with the president. And I was struck this week, the president had kind of two positions on, on short what happened in Charlottesville. He signed legislation condemning the white supremacists. On the other hand, he again returned to this idea there are both sides. That notion of both sides is this moral piece that right. Connolly is talking about. I think that is the core dilemma right now for Democrats who find themselves, and I think the somewhat unexpected position of being able to essentially dictate terms to President Trump and have Trump accept them. If that's the case, then why shouldn't you kind of be working towards a practical goal, not take advantage of that? On the other hand, <laughs> <laughs> when the president is unwilling to make firm condemnations of white supremacists, when the president until very recently employed advisors who uh, worked uh, or, or ran websites that sort of facilitated those kinds of groups. Um, working, delivering a political victory or a policy victory to the president is in some sense delivering him a political victory as well. And then you're stuck in the situation where your practical accomplishments end up bolstering someone who morally you have this uh, profound disagreement. And so I'm not really sure how Democrats square that circle, but I think it is a real dile dilemma. And I think on the activist level, liberal activists, progressive activists are very wary of this, this turn. Chuck Schumer is obviously comfortable making deals with Donald Trump. The base of Chuck Schumer's party right. not going to be so comfortable. Right. Ramesh, what did you make? The president met with Tim Scott. Tim Scott trying to talk to an African-American senator, Republican from South Carolina, about these issues. What was the net result of that interaction, do you think? 
You know, it's not clear because it was after that meeting that right. the president went out again and, and talked about both sides. And one of the things that I think that suggests is that even though President Trump has been getting very favorable publicity for working with the Democrats, he cannot resist relitigating this previous episode where he got very, very bad press. He just has to have the last word in on that argument. Right, and now we have violence in, in uh, St. Louis, which is going to perhaps provide another flashpoint moment for this question of race in America. Thank you to all of you. We're out of time. We'll be back in a moment to take a look at how Florida is recovering from Hurricane Irma. It's been a week since Hurricane Irma made landfall in the Florida Keys. CBS News national correspondent Manuel Bajorcas is in Marathon, Florida with an update. Well, John, as people start to return home, they will find in many cases that their homes are gone. FEMA estimates that 25 percent of homes here in the Florida Keys were destroyed by Hurricane Irma and a large number have heavy damage. Now, to be clear, not all parts of the Florida Keys look like this. Some parts escape the worst of Irma, but in neighborhoods like this, it could be months, even years before people can completely rebuild. And well, what is the greatest need throughout Florida right now? Well, it will be a financial one going forward as people try to get back on their feet, not only insurance claims, but also seeking assistance from FEMA. You can hear right now still some of the resources being deployed to help people. Helicopters and uh, Navy, Navy ships are uh, being positioned just off the Keys. But we should tell you that a week out from the hurricane hitting here, there are still pockets of South Florida that do not have power. And here in Monroe County, there are areas that lack clean running water, fuel and food. The governor of Florida, Rick Scott, said he's already spoken with the president and FEMA about what he considers the most pressing need going forward for the island chain, and that, uh, of course, is housing. And Manuel, what, at this point, do people think about the government response? Are they giving it a grade? Um, not a grade just yet, if you will. Uh, no response is ever going to be considered perfect. Uh, and there are certainly people who decided to ride out the storm who would say they faced a few days of desperation waiting for food and water. But from what we could see, uh, the preparation and cooperation between local, state, and federal officials really did pay off. Uh, we're talking about state officials urging people to evacuate as early as possible. And also the, from the federal government, all five branches of the military being prepositioned in areas nearby so that after the storm passed, they could try to get to some of the hard-hit areas and deliver food and water as quickly as possible. The big question, of course, going forward will be how people view the government's role in the recovery phase. Manuel Bajorquez, thanks so much, Manuel, and we'll be back in a moment. That's it for us today. Thanks for watching. Until next week, for Face the Nation, I'm John Dickerson.